Uh, my name is Lenny, Leonard Hilton McGurr. Uh, we're here in Brooklyn. I'm from New York. I'm an artist and I'm 65 years old. The subway school is, is, is a descendant of what was just graffiti on walls and people marking territory. At that time, most of the kids involved were in high school. You know, it was a kind of a school in, in the same sense that we were learning from each other, if you will. And there were some people who were more talented, skillful, stylish, whatever it may be, uh, phase two, rest in peace, you know, uh, stay high 149, rest in peace. Dondi, rest in peace, sadly. You know, that's, that's another kind of sad realization that a lot of the people who I, I were great friends of mine have, are, are no longer here, you know, and, and that's really sad. And that's why I actually like to mention them because I feel they're very much a part of what this thing has become in the, back when we were in school and the foundation of, of all of that. Myself, Dondi, and Zephyr, we were kind of like, we became very tight. And for a few years, we did a lot. We like ran a lot of projects together. We went around the world together. But in 80, I was ready to actually paint a whole car. You know, because that was the gold standard at the time. It, you know, a one wagon, one car of a subway train. Painted it over a four to five hour period. Went in there with nothing more than an idea that what I wanted to do was cover this train in color and not worry about letters and shadows. And it was completely spontaneous and, and abstract, obviously. So I was like, yeah, this is, you know, if I'm an artist, this is what I would paint, if you will. And then rather than using a canvas and an easel, I chose to do a subway train. To me, it was just some way to really define myself, and once again, just get that car. Because whether I got a photograph of it or not, that didn't matter in real time. I just knew, you know, like, you know, I did it. There it is. Like, look at it running. It was only a cherry on top, I think, to see the documentation in such a profound, you know, images later in life. My old friends were now modern day real graffiti writers, painting trains, riding in subway stations, painting murals in Hamble courts like a Lee Quinones, for example. Uh, I meet Fab Five Freddy, who's an instrumental character in my story at the time into the, the beginnings of a hip hop movement, if you will, with music and dance elements kind of percolating here and there in the Bronx, whatever. 80 to me is the probably most important year of the whole thing kind of coming together. Uh, we met Basquiat, we met Herring, Kenny, Scharf, uh, Ramel Z, obviously I would say someone like even a Debbie Harry singing a song like Rapture was a crossover moment for, all, for us all featuring Fred and Jean-Michel and Lee Quinones, but giving a kind of credibility to what we were doing, and certainly in the music aspect of it. So the class is 1981. They arrive in New York City. Uh, prior to their arrival, a club promoter asked me to paint uh, a banner uh, that they were going to literally unveil from the roof of, of this venue on 45th and Broadway. And myself, Zephyr, once again, we painted this massive banner, as big as this room, if you will, in terms of area space. So it was interesting, this kind of arrival of these guys, they're Brits, they're punks, they look cool as hell, they got you know the hair, everything. And then I meet, uh, well, Joe Stroman, rest, rest in peace. And Joe's like, oi, love what you're doing, mate, blah, 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 the energy. And he was really into what we were doing as graffiti writers. I think from a punk point of view, they kind of appreciated the rebellion or whatever the energy there was. But the beauty of their performances were all the opening acts for The Clash were rap groups from the city. So we respected them just on the strength of that. They were like, we would love to bring you on tour. And they bring me to Paris and London, and that's my first experience in Europe. 
And it was great for me, too, because I really discovered them. And we went on to work together uh, in their next album called Combat Rock, uh, with some very great songs on, on that record. And I even got a chance to sing on a record with The Clash on that album. Well, back to the globalness of everything, right? And, and, and the possibility of reaching people on a massive scale around the world. Because I think in addition to just that, the fact that you guys, Uniqlo is kind of everywhere and accessible. And you know, in addition to the fact that on the creative end, the thing I like even more than anything, and I'm working on some um, women's products, which I'm very happy about, but it's just the uh, stuff for kids. You know, the kids are the future, right? We've, we've said that, you know, many times, and I believe that, certainly. I'm just optimistic, I think. I mean, I have to be, right? I, and I think I've always been my whole life. I'm looking at things now, and I'm thinking, man, you know, at this point in my life, the most precious thing for me is, is probably life itself, right? And so maybe a young person in their 20s looking at someone like me saying, wow, you know, like I like to, when I get to future as age, I really hope, you know, I'm doing what I want to do. And, you know, and I've been very fortunate, of course, and I've had my health, but I'm still thinking that's probably, you know, the most valuable thing I've got beyond the, you know, the love of my family and, and you know, and my immediate loved ones in that sense. I want to hit 90 at least, you know. So that's my that's my gold right now. <laughs>